Klopp is from the Black Forest. Is it a football orientated area at all? Not really. I mean, the southwest of Germany has produced a lot of interesting football people, and he's certainly one of them, but it is quite rural. Um, it is quite slow paced. Uh, there was a tennis court, there's a football pitch, um, so everything very close to him and his father, who really gave him uh, that spirit of competitiveness, made good use of all these facilities. Um, but Klopp is perhaps somebody who very quickly realized that he needed to move beyond that very rural um, region because footballing wise, I don't think he would have made it as a, as a professional there. What, what was Murphy like? You just described Murphy because it's a, it's a small village, almost in the middle of nowhere, where time passes by and ignores them and they get left behind. And it's interesting that uh, he talks about a picture that describes what he is like. And it's a picture of him as a four-year-old uh, with shorts, no top on, a ball under his arm, and behind some like goose or cows or in the middle of the countryside. That serves him, and I think it's probably the same with Klopp, serves him as a reference. If you lost at some point, that's the guy that I am. And it has to do with simple life in a way, which, which I think that perhaps they miss it, but they run away from as well. So uh, Pochettino needed a ma much more complex life and had to go away because there was no possibility really of developing as a player. Uh, and from the moment that he was picked up from, uh, from Bielsa and that famous 1am visit to his house, uh, with his assistant uh, where, I don't know if you know the story, but actually they were looking for players in the area, in the Rosario area, and uh, they were told that there was this guy that couldn't make the trials that he had organized for Newell's Old Boys. So had to go to Murphy at one o'clock in the morning, so you can imagine in the middle of nowhere, uh, had to stop in a petrol station asking for Pochettino's house, and of course it's a small village, everybody knows where everybody is and where everybody lives went into the house, so I want to see your son. Parents are like, really? This is one o'clock in the morning. Anyway, once they're inside, they realize, what are we going to do? So some, one of, I think it was the assistant said, can we see his legs? And they showed him his legs. Oh, he's going to be a footballer. And walk away, but invited him to a, to a trial. So he had to be rescued from there, but soon he realized he didn't belong to the small world, that he wanted a, a much, much bigger world. But you mentioned his dad. Did his dad have an influence in his upbringing as a, as a, as a top athlete? Yeah, his dad had a huge influence because um, he would take him onto the tennis court at six in the morning on Saturday and beat him heavily, mm -hmm. six nil, six nil, and Klopp would not enjoy it. And then he would take him a few months later skiing and just ski and Klopp would have to kind of figure out what to do and he did not enjoy it. And the same with the football, he had to go and go for headers all the time, run around the pitch, heading again, heading again. Um, so not really, I think, a very warm relationship. And I think it took Klopp many years to understand that his father of a different generation was probably, maybe not able to communicate his love for him in words, but he did it by spending all this time with him and by making sure he would become an athlete. And through him, Klopp's father, Norbert, lived the dream because he had had a trial um, for FC Kaiserslautern um, as the FCK in the 50s and didn't make it and his parents also didn't want him to make it but Klopp of course uh, did make it but uh, your story just got me thinking of another story because Klopp always said the reason why he ended up from the small village team to the slightly better team is not because he was so good but they that other team wanted a teammate of his but they needed someone to drive and his father and his mum would drive so they took him just along for the ride. Maybe he's being a little bit um, self-deprecating, but you know there were always more talented people wherever he was. Right, in the case of Pochettino, you don't have a, a lot of talent, but he was the best in the area. A lot of talent compared to the top talented people in the world, but he was already seen as, as a talented player. And so much so that when he went to the trial, uh, Bielsa took five minutes to see it. And, you know, having made the trial eventually after the visit, into his house, five minutes, he's like, out. And he's like, what have I done? And what it is, is that you can recognize when a talented player receives the ball, what he does with it. And sometimes Klopp, Pochettino, they, they look for reasons to explain their 
upbringing and their football education and why they got into places. But sometimes they've got it in them, they've got the mentality for it. It seems like they wanted to explore the bigger world. They've got the mental strength to do it as a teenager, for instance, had to live on his own and almost died because he left the, the gas uh, heater on and uh, couldn't breathe when he woke up in the morning. So he had to go through all this at 16. Uh, but you don't go through all this unless you have a, a total belief that you can make it. I think, wasn't Claude the same? I th I'm not sure how Klopp really made it because he was not a very good footballer. I mean, he was on the fringes of the professional game, trying to survive in the third division, trying to survive in the second division, but really not really in a position to be comfortable. He would do stuff on the side. He would work for a film company. He would um, do an internship for a TV company on the sports desk. He had already, during his career, um, figured out that this might not last and he would have to do something quickly in order to not to be on the street with a young child um, and, and a wife and, and no real prospect of, of making a living. So I think he spent most of his professional career in fear that they might go down and uh, you know if you go with Mainz for example from second to third division it would have been the end of professional contracts and uh, they would have all been on the street and maybe not found a different, another club to play for. So I think it was an ambition driven from almost an existential fear and a need to do something maybe different and then also to work really hard at staying a player with limited talent but then also even I think thinking as a manager trying to help the team survive by any means necessary because it would mean his financial survival. So it was more than the usual, you know, we didn't want to go down, it would have been bad. It was a real personal need to stay a footballer with very limited talent. That's the difference with Pochettino in terms of how it, it all worked for him from the beginning. So there was a belief, there wasn't fear involved and won the league as an 18 year old. He loved the fact that he was important to the side learned a lot about how he works in the changing room. He took that Argentinian culture with him uh, as a coach after. And loved the fact that by winning you become God. I think we're, you know, there's a little bit of a diva behind that, uh, that approach to the world. That was a good feeling too. You know, you must have to remember him with the long hair, etc. And then getting to the national side as well was, was another success. Going to Spain and succeeding as a player was, uh, was what came next. So, he seemed to have uh, perhaps uh, uh, certainly a strong mentality and belief that, that drove him through. Do you believe that both Klopp and Pochettino obviously learned from here, there and everywhere, but what we've seen is a reflection of their own personalities as much as what they learned? Absolutely. I think with Jürgen is two key factors. One is he was a player at a time when coaches would just shout at you. There was very little tactical input in Germany in those places. Uh, if a team lost it was because they didn't want it enough. Uh, if a team lost the manager would blame the team for losing, for not playing well enough. And I don't think anyone enjoyed it at all with a backdrop that they were always pretty bad and fighting against relegation. And I think he made a decision very early on that he wanted to be a manager the type of which he as a player would have loved to, to have. Somebody who helps you somebody who takes you serious as a human being, somebody who doesn't put the pressure on you but on themselves. He very, very early on told players, don't worry about losing. I will lose as a manager. You can just concentrate on winning. Little things like that. And uh, on a more theoretical level, if you will, he was heavily influenced by a manager that he had at Mainz, Wolfgang Frank, who was ahead of his time by playing a very innovative system at the time which had to do with zonal marking, which had to do with pressing, things that were seen as, as witchcraft in the German second division, maybe even in the first, in the mid-90s, and uh, suddenly made Mainz as a team play so much better. And suddenly they, for the first time, were able to beat teams that were individually better equipped and uh, had this this belief that together they could do something that they didn't think was possible. And I think those two things 
really set him up for what then became a very successful coaching career. And don't forget the, the job at Mainz he got because the people at Mainz thought he would be the guy that would bring back the Wolfgang Frank ideas and he was able to do that. So in the case of Pochettino, what you've got is somebody that has added everywhere he's been. So he takes from Argentina, the behavior in the changing room, you know you have to respect the authority, you know, you know you, there is a discipline that has to be followed, you know that uh, there are things that you're supposed to do and you're not supposed to do. And that's very clear, it's black and white in Argentina. He takes that with him. He takes the versatility and adaptability of the Argentinians. Wherever they go, they take a little bit from where they are and they add their own. He's always done that. Coaching-wise, Marcelo Bielsa, a little bit like uh, Franz, was a guy that was different to everybody else. So he uh, will demand everybody to run. There was a time where only back four and one of the midfielders run, everybody else just passed the ball. So you've got uh, the ability to pressure high, man marking, a lot of things that weren't usually in football, in Argentinian football either, basically made them think differently about the game, bring passion as well. So it was a bit of psychology as well as the tactics. So he's not a pupil of Bielsa, it's hardly, you, you see both teams, the Bielsa team and Pochettino's team have got nothing to do with each other, but he's taken a lot of the philosophy of Bielsa into his football. Goes into Spain as a player first and realizes that football is much more than he had learned in Argentina. Layers of uh, tactical, individual uh, development, uh, collective work, psychological, technical, all that he, uh, you can see in every Spanish coach. Different layers that they apply to the coaching. Again, the versatility. That mixture is what made Pochettino. So if you ask him, who is your main reference? Him, because he believes that the teams have to be brave, have to come out and believe that everything is possible, have to be not feeling inferior to anybody, have to run more than anybody, everybody has to run. So his personality plus his cultural development, football development, which you can see now. Add that, what he's learned from England. He tells a story of, how uh, after an early game of Southampton, he prepares the team. It's all about combining, right? Building from the back and the midfield comes in and then the, 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 the forward comes deeper, link, link up. And then on the tunnel on the way out, somebody shouts, right guys, build it from the back. Hey, one of the players, build it from the back, remember. But anyway, after five minutes, just ball to the channel and run and ball to the channel. It's like, what? No, no, this is not what we're doing here. So, and then, a couple of years later, perhaps already a Spurs, he goes like, what's wrong with actually running into the channel? What's wrong into playing it behind, playing it long? Which of course helped with your NT and Ajax. So it's, it's taken that as well. Plus the, uh, the total admiration of the, uh, of the English players, that's, that's also added into his armor now. And that's Pochettino. Klopp feels like he's a guy that you want to play for. As well as a good person, is, is that what Liverpool players feel when they are when they've got him as a manager. Yeah, I think it's um, it's obvious that players respond, of course, to the hugs and to the smiles and to all this stuff. But that is only on the surface. What they really respond to is to a guy that helps them play better, that helps them do their job. And I think that is something at the heart of Klopp's philosophy. What can I do? to make this guy play better and then as an extension help the team perform. That really is what coaching is. It doesn't necessarily work with pressure, it doesn't work necessarily with authority. Of course these things are all tools to get people to buy into that but they will only really buy into it if they feel that they're being helped by the coach. And I think he once said that he as a child wanted to be a doctor and he thinks you know that that kind of idea that I want to help others, uh, make them feel better, or you know, make them healthier um, in the head, on the in the legs. That is how he coaches as well. Have you heard any Liverpool player saying it's changed my life, it's changed my way of thinking about life, or is it, as you're suggesting, just the fact that because it's made them better, they're absolutely in love with him? But is there no personal angle to it? No, there's of course a personal angle to it because I think he spends a lot of time trying to understand the human uh, person, the, the human being, because that helps you then to really talk to them in the right way. Somebody wants more of a 
tender approach. Somebody wants more to be pushed. I think as a good coach, you need to know how to talk to, the, to your people um, effectively, but that comes by understanding their fears, their hopes, their emotions, uh, their problems aside from the pitch. Um, I haven't heard Liverpool players sort of reference it uh, very strongly, but I know that at Melwood, at the training center, a lot of people kind of see him as the guy that you can go to if you have issues that have nothing to do with football. That's just who he is. Yeah, Pochettino has got the similar relation to the players as you described perfectly that idea that the more you know them, the more you can get of them, of course. Uh, it is, it's an interesting uh, trait. Uh, players are given their lives and their way of thinking in exchange of being better, better coached because, as you said, they actually come out at the end of it being better players. But I think Pochettino takes it a step further. He wants, he demands uh, that the kid that started playing football, that's still inside of the players, to come out in every training session. He doesn't want players coming to the training session as they're going to work. Uh, he wants them to think differently about the game. And he's managed to get some of those players thinking they changed my life. Uh, Danny Rose will tell you that. Harry Kane will tell you that. Dele Alli will tell you that, even though perhaps it's, it's more difficult to get through him, but he has been uh, molded as well mentally by, by Pochettino. The biggest one will tell you that is Hugo Lloris. That hook at the end of the Ajax game just tell you everything. There is a, there's a connection there that, that is magical. And, and for the book, I was lucky enough to be invited to personal talks. I was just in a corner trying to be invisible. You, you're never invisible, but more or less they reproduce the natural chats that they would have. It had nothing to do with football and had everything to do with the kids, with what they did during the day, what the illusions, the hopes are. And Hugo Lloris will say, it's changed my life. I came, when he came in, I didn't want to play football, almost. But the thing that changed it was to make him believe, really, that, okay, you haven't won a lot, but it's not about winning. Success comes on the back of actually giving everything in every training session. And at the end of the week saying, I have given everything. That changed the way Hugo Lloris thought of it. Plus he's won now, so, uh, that, that obviously at the end helps, but it is about getting to know the player, which is a link that seems to be with ball managers. They actually do put so much energy into that. Yeah, and also I think the idea that, as you said, results and success comes from within. Um, to teach players that it's within your control. If you do things in the right way, eventually you will be rewarded. It might not be this season, it might not be next season, it might not be in a particular game, but if you do the same good things all the time, if you develop a routine that is good, if you develop a healthy living, if you eat the right things, sleep enough, all these things will help you to succeed. I mean, these are simple lessons, but I think they need to be repeated all the time to really take hold. And you're annoyed that a lot of people are refer uh, talking about clubs saying, oh, but he hasn't won enough. When actually, clearly, he's, 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 he's changed Liverpool, hasn't he? I'm personally not annoyed, annoyed but he might be. <laughs> um, uh, although, of course, in public he says, I don't care. And he's lucky in a sense, I think, that the fans and the owners of Liverpool, the people who really matter, don't think that way. So when you see that, that line of a thought or that narrative, it does not correspond to what the important people think. They see the bigger picture. They see a club that had lost itself that was going nowhere, that was stuck in the table, that was playing boring football, had no connection between the fans and the players and the city. All of that is gone, and now everyone's happy and excited about every single game. That is the bigger picture. Of course, um, when you come closer and closer and you experience that high and you experience that anticipation, you want to take it one step further. You want to win the big trophy. And of course people would be very unhappy and he would be disappointed and the, the players would be distraught and the fans would be very unhappy if they don't make it. But I think he manages to put that pressure on himself and frees up the dressing room by saying, look, people will blame me. They will talk about me as the loser if we don't do it. You just go and perform to your ability. That's all we can do. Isn't that more or less what he said uh, before the Barcelona games as well? Just go out there and do what you know what, that you can do. Yeah, that, that's what he said. He said, um, we 
don't have to think about miracles or don't have to think about four goals. We'll just try to play the game and win it little by little and then see what happens and just play with, without fear, play with, uh, he always references uh, uh, human anatomy, anatomy uh, areas uh, that are important in football. <laughs> um, show, yes. show your character. Um, and that was enough. But of course, there's also an idea behind it. And I think that sometimes gets lost. I mean, it is not just motivation. It is not just somebody, you know, clapping on the sidelines. It is also strategy and things that help you then put your best foot forward and come um, and get your character and get your ability onto the pitch. And that comes with, with huge work and with huge ideas. But specifically coming back to, the, to this idea with the trophy, I think he will feel the pressure. But at the same time, I don't think he is so arrogant to believe that he is playing the final. So as much as he will feel the pressure, he will try to make sure that none of that pressure is felt by the players and that none of his decision making is in any way influenced by, by the pressure. And I don't think it will be because he's quite a rational guy and he said, you know, what I've done with Dortmund, for example, losing in 2013, it has no relevance for this game. Mm -hmm. Maybe you learn from specific substitutions or tactical things, but it's nothing that he did wrong then that you can somehow say, oh, okay, this time I'm going to do it differently. It doesn't work like that. So I think despite the sense of the occasion, he'll be relatively relaxed and try to give that the players the same kind of belief that, you know what, you just go, you just perform and then things will take care of it itself. It's partly the, uh, the feeling, uh, and that's the feeling I had talking to Pochettino this week, that the job is done in a way. And the job is done by the sel selection of players, by the coaching that has been done up till now, by the lessons that have been taken from the feeds. All that is done. This week is about preparing yourself physically, mostly resting if you can, after a very long season. And then once uh, we go into the pitch, there'll be an idea of what has to be done, maybe an adjustment at half time, and that's it. The rest of the job is done. That makes me think that. Uh, even if he doesn't win the Champions League, and of course winning the Champions League will change the narrative all, all of a sudden. Yeah, but you, uh, the next narrative will be, but you, you just won the Champions League. Whatever is the narrative next, it will be that the project is finished and it's been successful. Because the plan this season, the target was to get into the Champions League. So next season, in a full new season in the new stadium, there will be uh, European nights, Champions League nights. So the target is absolutely met. They're two steps ahead Nobody expected them to arrive to the Champions League. Winning or not winning it, of course you want to win it once you're there. But the project is uh, successful and finished. And when he's talking about, we would see what happens, what he's trying to say is, he wants everybody on the toes. Fans not to take things for granted. Media to realize that we are wrapping something up and we are starting uh, Pochettino's team number two from the day after the Champions League final. And then let's see if that is successful as well. But this one, this one that has been five years at, whatever happens, it is already successful. But of course, in both sides, there are winners. In both sides, are, they want a memory, a night to remember. Uh, only one can win, but whatever has happened for both of them has been a fantastic journey of which they've learned so much. And I think, I don't know if you agree, it feels like it's another step towards something else, as in, it's no one-off. This will continue, no? Well, I mean, for Klopp, it is his third Champions League final, and uh, it was interesting, after the Barcelona game, he said, we all were sitting in the dressing room in Kiev after losing against Real Madrid in, in pretty dramatic circumstances, and said, this cannot be the end. We cannot leave it like this. We have to come back. And of course, there's no guarantee that you can do it, but it was pretty remarkable, I think, uh, to use a defeat as a motivating um, tool and to kind of reframe the discussion. But I think what, what is important to understand maybe for, for people who don't follow these managers so closely and who just look at the bottom line and the trophies, these are guys who are overachievers, serial overachievers. They overachieve everywhere they go. 
and that's why whether they lose or not um, on Saturday in in Madrid if tomorrow they say okay I want to go somewhere else there'd be a long queue of the best clubs in the world wanting them to work for them because they can take something and do more with it than could be expected and that is that is what coaching is all about so the good news for for Liverpool and Klopp is that for once they are favourites. Yes. Maybe they were favourites against Sevilla in the Europa League final, that's debatable, but all these other finals that he has lost, whether with Liverpool or, no, or with Dortmund, they weren't really expected to win it. This time, I think if you'd ask neutrals, if you, if you look how public opinion is, most people would say Liverpool are favourites. So that comes with a bit more pressure, but maybe also with a bit more conviction and confidence that they can do it. And I think the way that the team has developed, they are psychologically, physically and also in a sort of a footballing sense in terms of their development, really ready for this. So I'm fairly confident they can do it this time. <laughs> Certainly, Spurs feel they're ready. I sense from the fans that they're happy to be in a final. Uh, but I can guarantee you that's not how they feel inside the camp. They are thinking of, of winning it. And to, to win it, they will need a very good performance to stop the best players of Liverpool and a bit of luck. They've had all of that, all of that, and performed themselves to the maximum level the, uh, you know, the whole season, so so difficult to predict this one.